Right. Cool. Okay. So um, welcome to the people in this room. Today we will talk about what happens after UADC. Um, so my take is that there is a lot of content out there um, on how to get better at debating or how to get better at judging. Um, and not that much content out there for how to help other people get better at debating or judging. And I think um, the kind of natural next step for someone who does well at a major is that they get thrust into this role of now being somewhat responsible for helping other people get better at debating or judging. And that is a role that um, can kind of be not immediately familiar to a lot of people. Because I think um, when you are kind of in the mindset of trying to become, be, be a competitive debater, trying to get that break at UADC or AVP or Australs or Worlds or, or so on and so forth, you're really in a mindset that's kind of like focused on how do I make myself better at debating? Um, or if you're trying to succeed as a judge, how do I make myself better at judging? And there's a lot, a lot of stuff out there on how to kind of move from the mindset of how do I help myself to how do I build structures that help others? Um, as well as, I think, a lot of advice out there for how do you kind of manage the transition from being a good debater or a good judge to the roles of someone who takes their first hatch call gig. So I want to cover that a little bit. Um, and the kind of assumption behind all this um, is that success at a major puts you in that position of responsibility, which might be a contestable proposition. So I'm going to cover that in a bit. Um, so today we're going to do three things. We are going to one, cover why it is good for you to take responsibility, why the expectation that someone who has done well at a major, who has just broken at UATC, should now give back and should now take up edge compositions and try and help other people, why that is good and correct. Um, and two, and three, we're going to talk about how you can service that responsibility, how you can help other people do speaker and judge development, and what you should expect um, when it comes to doing your first edge call gig. So apologies to people who came to this lecture, um, kind of like, you know, uh, looking at a provocative title and be like, ah, oh, Yarn is going to tell me how to um, you know, turn one break at a major into multiple breaks at multiple majors. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not here to do that. Um, what is this sound? Okay, sorry, I, that's my bad. Um, yeah, I, I'm not going to do that. I think there's a lot of material out there to tell you how to get better at debating. And honestly, I don't think it changes that much after your first break. Like getting better just is still kind of the same process. Um, I am, however, kind of concerned more with that kind of transition between doing stuff focused on yourself and doing stuff that could help others. Okay, so the first the first thing we're gonna talk about, um, taking responsibility. Why, why should you do this? I think um, as a debater, a, a, a lot of the time we kind of spend time trying to work on ourselves, make ourselves better at debating, try to get the next break, get the next championship win, and so on and so forth. Um, and there's a temptation after you kind of make that big break that like, oh, nothing has changed. Um, you know, I'm still just a debater. I, I want to hang out with my friends. Um, you, you know, just because I broke at UADC or just because like I, 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 you know, won this tournament or whatever, it, it shouldn't change anything. I should just be able to act the same way as I previously did. Um, and I think the classic kind of trade-off is like, um, everyone has like finite amount of time in a year. Um, and a finite number of tournaments you want to go to and people are like oh uh, I, I want to go to this open with my friend um because i think it'll be fun and so on and so forth now of course that's fine um i just want to point out that because there is that trade-off every tournament you kind of do with your friend when you're kind of already a senior member of the community is a tournament that you kind of lose the opportunity to um help potentially your juniors uh, if you were priming them, or the wider local community and circuit, if you were to judge at a tournament and so on and so forth. So I think it's kind of important to balance those things and to kind of have that recognition that um, because you've, that, that like with the additional rep 
you've gained um, and like the additional doors that open for you um, because you've just broken at UADC or done well and now have like ascended into a position of respect amongst your um, friends and community that there does exist some kind of like power and reciprocal obligation to help other people as well. And so oh, this is not to say like you, you should, you know, kind of change yourself in a way and stop hanging out with our friends. But it's just to know that like you, you ought to be aware that like um you probably have to you know be nice to first years even if it might you don't immediately click with them and feel like you want to spend time with them and things like that. Just, just little obligations like that that I think socially people should kind of recognize that uh, they have to accept once you have done well and certain things are expected of you. Um, the second thing to note is I think um especially during this kind of like extended oh uh, lull i guess if it, it can feel um that of, of covid for two years that that has kind of like been the entire reality of, of many of the debaters um in, in this room or like listening to this video later on um it, it feels like the dinos are around forever in, in some in some circuits it feels like people like myself or like the other people in this lecture series um they are you know just available they, they they're here uh, giving video lectures um you know edge coring things and, and so on and so forth and I, I think it's important to realize that well, like it, dinos have an important role to play. Uh, they, they, the advice they give is like super valuable, and it's good to have that kind of like experience around. Um, they can't lead a club's revival or growth. Like we are distant from the circuit in a way that people like you guys who are going to do well at UADC and ABP and go on a break at local IVs and opens and are just kind of like debating every week and week out you guys are kind of plugged in in a way that we're not. Um, and that means that like in, in terms of being updated onto like what what works now with with like today's crop of first years or, or whatever, um, we are much less aware of, of that kind of stuff. And the second thing is that dinos have limited time. Uh, once people start becoming working adults, they typically have a one much less flexible schedules and two even if they have flexible schedules tend to kind of want to allocate a smaller percentage of their time to debating than students who for some reason who are really obsessed with university debating and want to allocate a large proportion of their time to debating i i, I know i did that when i was a student myself so dinos just don't have enough time and deep knowledge to kind of really lead um like your week-to-week -week training sessions and so they're like they're useful as advisors but they can't be kind of relied on to really kind of train speakers and train judges. And it's this kind of like, I guess, intermediate group of speakers who or judges who have just recently done well at majors and are kind of growing into that role of seniority who kind of need to pick up the slack um, for the circuit to thrive. So that's kind of like obligation stuff, like, you know, like standard reciprocal obligation stuff. But I think that's kind of self-interested benefits as well. Um, and, and the first is like, you are more likely to succeed again as a speaker to repeat your break at a major if your club and community is strong um, because you'll be able to pull resources because the local competition at training or in your home city will raise the standard um, in ways I think that are kind of hard to replicate with individual training or even kind of like online collectives. Um, like Partly because those things tend to be kind of sometimes kind of individual centric, like maybe you are really enthusiastic about speaking and so spend a lot of time in like online spa groups but maybe some of your teammates aren't um and it's like kind of hard to ask them to join that if they don't want the same level of commitment so on and so forth but if you were to do kind of like local trainings or club trainings then you can raise everyone up together um and the other thing is like it's just fun and rewarding to see people who are your friends and people you care about get better and to do well i think um at some point it kind of clicks for everyone that kind of like what you get out of debating they're kind of like good feelings you get of doing well stop being about like the good feelings of yourself doing well and like breaking or winning stuff and it's more about like the good feelings of seeing people you've helped the debating do well um like i went through that transition myself um when i stopped being a competitive speaker and started kind of judging more and edge coring more and just kind of trying to coach and help people out and i think that will be a thing that many of you will go through as well um in the kind of months and years after you get your first or your subsequent um, breaks at majors. So it is kind of a thing that is rewarding. Um, people should help out 
their club in their community. So hopefully with that, um, that is kind of like sufficient reasoning for why the first premise of my lecture holds that you should take responsibility and you should help out. Um, before I move on to the next bit, I want to kind of note like two modes of, I guess, like speaker and judge development. And the first kind of, this is not in a slide, I should put in a slide, it's fine. Um, the first kind of model is, I think, the individual centric model. And this was obviously like a, a big feature of, of speaker and judge development um, pre-COVID, but I think has kind of like really intensified uh, during the kind of online era of debating. And that is like things like watching videos on your own, uh, method loading or like reading, um, doing PM speeches um, on like a motion prompt, um, joining like an online community of like spa or of like fellow debate enthusiasts, like spa groups and so on and so forth. Um, and I want to note that like this involves like time alone. This is time, given that, you know, time is finite. This is time you're not spending with your teammates or your clubmates. This is time you kind of spend self-improving. And that, that's an important part of speaker and judge development. But again, spending more time on this kind of individual centric development model is less time you can spend on like club training. Um, in the end, like everyone has to kind of like find the right balance for how much time you want to spend just kind of developing yourself as a speaker and developing like the people around you along with yourself um, as a speaker or as a judge. And the second model, so the second model is like kind of like the club and community centric model, right? Which is, I think, the traditional model in which speakers kind of like improved um, or like prepared for majors together. Like they will hold club trainings, they'll do like recruitment, they'll run like socials so that people want to stick around in the club and so on and so forth. Um, and everyone in the club tries to improve together. Um, I, I, I think there is kind of like a, a essential need for this kind of training and development as well. Like one, these people are your teammates for majors. Like it doesn't matter how good you are because you're always going to need one or one or two other people who are as good as you if you want to do out a major. So you you kind of have like a self interested incentive in helping the people around you. Um, and two, just socially as well, they're kind of bound to you and similar to you. More likely to have aligned interests, preferences, backgrounds, and whatever to you. Um, then I think kind of like online debate friends maybe don't have. Um. Especially as in-person debate returns, I I do expect like club in, intra club friendships to kind of make a um make a big revival. Like I think if you if you ask people from the period prior to COVID, they'll say that like most of their like kind of lasting debate friends um are just kind of people who were in the same club as them or in the same city as them. It's just kind of natural. You spend the most time together and you have the most in common, so you end up these are like kind of like friends you kind of keep beyond debating to the extent to which you care about that. So again, just not, not to say that an individual development model is like invalid. It is valid. It, you, you, sh you should keep doing it, um, you know, but you should, I think, carve out some time to build up your club, build up the debate community in your city and so on and so forth. Okay, so how do we do that? Um, skipping straight ahead into the second section. Um, speaker development. I want to cover this kind of like very not in detail because I think there's a lot of material about how to become better even when you're already kind of good at like breaking at UDC level. Um, just want to note a few things here, especially as you're trying to um, do speaker training for people other than yourself. The first thing is to just remember that like things that work for you may not work for others. Like different people kind of develop differently. So um, some people are like, I like watching debate videos and this is how I get better. Some people are like, I like doing practicing PM features and this is how, this is how I get better. Um, you have to remember that like when designing training for members of your club, like different people will have different kind of like, I, I, just different learning styles, um, different willingness to kind of work on their own in front of a screen. And so you want to kind of design trainings that um, presumably can, can get as, as many people to participate at one time um, and so on and so forth. So um, the second thing to note here is how do I scale the impact of my, of my time and like kind of like, um, yeah, the time I spent with with other people uh, in my club, in my community. So for example, like you could choose to, um, you know, that's that is that like a weekend IV or weekend open. You could choose to uh, go with a friend. Um, that will be fun for you. It will not develop anyone. You could choose to go with some potential teammates that will, you know, help uh, train all these people. And it will, um, yeah, uh, you could go, you could choose to pro-am. Um, that would mean that like, you know, the juniors in your club get some exposure to like competition at a not novice level, at a not pro-am level. Um, 
or you could choose to judge at this tournament, which would scale your impact beyond kind of just like the one or two people you go to the tournament with um, and like spread it to every single room you judge at that tournament. So again, not to kind of say that you should do one of these things and you should not do the others of these things, but it's kind of important to have that in mind. They're like um, different, I guess like actions of participation have different scales of impact in terms of like how many people in this community um, can I help out? And that's why like kind of people think of like CAing as a thing that could help a lot of people and like judging that as a thing that could also help a lot of people and so on and so forth. So um, I, I do think there is kind of value in um, judging more and speaking a little bit less um, for speakers that I target in this in this lecture, like the speakers who have broken at one major or two majors and are kind of now growing to that role as like senior members of the community, um, judge more because your impact is bigger. Um, thirdly, in terms of speaker development, I think one tip um, that you can kind of apply to other more kind of granular advice you watch in other videos is to just kind of focus on one thing at a time. Um, I think it's really hard to self-assess the quality of a speech when you're trying to kind of assess it holistically, like was this a good speech or a bad speech? Um, like that is a, I think self-assessment is kind of like the number one skill to develop to help yourself get better at debating and to help people around you get better at debating. But it's kind of something that like takes a lot of time and experience. Like you'll get better at self-assessment um, the more debating you do uh, and the more judging that you do. So like, I can't, we can't like teach that in one lecture. But what I can say is like self-assessing holistically is really hard. Um, but it's very, it's, it's much easier to kind of self-assess whether you've achieved one specific goal you set out to do. So suppose your goal is like, in this speech, I will um, speak more slowly, or in this speech, I will sign post clearly, or in this speech, I will make sure I rebut all the important claims of my opponent. Um, pick one of these things to do as a training focus and self-assess whether you or your teammates who was trying to do this thing has achieved just this thing. So. It's important to kind of get yourself into that training mindset. That like, especially in training rounds, which are like, like not even in competitions, just like you're you're doing club training with your friends, right? Like, go into that round being, not necessarily being like, I'm trying to gonna win this round. I need to take first. I need to give like, eighty twos, whatever. Um, just go into the round being like, what is my objective for this round? In this round, um, we discussed earlier that we should work on rebuttal, or we discussed earlier that um we should work on framing and strategy, and at the end of the round, just assess, did our speeches achieve the thing we set out to work on? If it's working on rebuttal, uh, did we adequately rebut um, the opponents? Now, you can think about trade-offs later. Like maybe that meant that you don't have enough time for constructive material or whatever. That's fine. You can work that out later. Um, if your focus was like, we need to have a clear frame, uh, you know, make it really clear to judges what we were trying to prove in this round, did we do that? And if you did, okay, job done. You can then assess, how do I combine this thing with other things in subsequent speeches. But important thing to note here is just like, have one goal in mind and assess whether you achieved that goal. Um, then you can start to think about how to like bring everything together um, afterwards. I, I think lots of people just kind of like go into rounds being like, I, I want to give a better speech. Uh, I want to get better at everything at once. And they just kind of like bash their head against the wall. And Eventually you improve, yeah. I just think it's, it's it's maybe a slower process and it's like a more unpleasant process because you go through a lot of speeches where you're like, oh, it still wasn't that good. I, I did this thing better, but then I did this thing worse. So it's still kind of mid. Uh, I'm really sad because I didn't give a good speech. Um, yeah, so I think this kind of training mindset where you just focus on one thing at a time can help. Um, and you can do that in competitions as well, um, especially for programs. And by, by that, I mean, competitions where you know you're programming, not necessarily program competitions. Like if you're taking a less experienced speaker to a competition as someone who like has broken at UADC or other majors, if you're going with people who have not yet broken at UADC or other majors, um, you can kind of approach that competition with that mindset as well. Like less focused on like, we want to break high and um, win the comp, but just uh, the focus of this competition is, is making sure that like my juniors um, fix these, like weaknesses in their speeches or improve in these areas of improvement that we identified before the tournament. Um, and then just kind of focus on that in terms of training and development. So I think this kind of intentional speaker development um, is really helpful to kind of bear in mind uh, both during training and like 
taking competitions as training rather than just being super competitive and like being super invested in the results of every single small competition you go to. Okay, so that's that's it for speaker development. Um, I didn't want to cover this in great detail because I think there's a lot of good material out there about this. Um, right, next up, judge development. Um, this is chronically underrated in, in the circuit right now. Like you can see every circuit complaining that there are no good judges, uh, this judge is sus, that judge is sus. Um, yeah, uh, it has really been kind of neglected for some time. I, I do think that the judge crisis is a little bit less bad in Asia than maybe it is in other regions. Um, because in Asia, we have like the rise of the competitive judge, like the judging track, right? Like, especially at UADC with like mathematical judge break. We, we've long had this notion that like um, judges can like compete um, to get like good feedback from, from, from speakers. And then like that will show you who's the like best judge. And, and that kind of incentivizes people to do the judging track rather than just speaking. And I think that is you know, like fine. It, it has made the judging situation less bad here than it is elsewhere. But I think it's also an imperfect solution. Um, not to say we should like do away with it. You know, it, it is here to stay, that's fine. Because all it, all it does, I think, is like it aligns judges' incentives in a world of self-interested people um, with, yeah, with like, I guess like getting people to judge because then they can also receive those sweet, sweet, dopamine hits of rep when they like rank top 10 judge or, or whatever. Um, so yeah, I get it. It's like an incentive structure, sure. Um, but I kind of think that like, you, you know, in the ideal world, judges don't really compete. Like competing is just kind of a way to serve debaters best. Um, and so while it's good that combated, like the competitive judge circuit incentivizes some people to judge in Asia who would otherwise prefer to speak, um, I also think there's just kind of like a large duty element um, where senior debaters who were not on the judge and competitive judging track should go back and judge um, after they break at some majors. Like as a UADC breaking speaker, as the target of this lecture, you are now a senior debater and you should go back to judge. Um, one, self-interestedly, it makes you better at debating. Um, I think a lot of skills in debating like weighing clashes um, figuring out which clash to respond to and which is more important, uh, like easily, more easily honed by having to do those things as a judge. Um, there's like a reason, for example, that people often say like good whip speeches or good reply speeches are like biased oral adjudications. And it's cause like they're identifying the same thing the judge wants and just tilting them in the direction of their team. Um, I'll say that's probably true of first speakers as well. Um, like what you're doing as a first speaker is you're identifying all the things the judge will need proven um, and then proving them. So judging will help you identify the things that need proving uh, and then you become better at when, 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 you, when the turn comes for you to speak. So just instrumentally and like from a position of self-interest, I think going back to judge and therefore kind of like bring allowing your experience to help more people um, as per the scale of impact thing I said earlier is kind of good for yourself as a speaker. Um, so yeah, you, you, you should judge. And importantly, you should help other people judge. Um, and this is the second thing, right? So the first thing is you should judge. Um, the second thing is you should help train new judges um, because this is kind of like a thing that is really important for the circuit to thrive. Again, I said, like I said, in Asia, the competitive judge thing helps to naturally funnel some people towards judging. Um, but I, I still think there's kind of like a lack of training for new people, even people who want to become competitive judges. So here are some um, ideas on how to do judge training and how to run judge training sessions at your club. Um, one, I think one thing with judge training is that it can kind of come across as time consuming um, more so than debate training. So I guess like with like debate training, you just debate uh, and you can kind of maybe tune out for the rest of the debate, even though you shouldn't. And so, it's like people still like doing that. Whereas as a judge, um, especially as a new or novice judge, you have to listen to six to eight speakers speak, and then you have to listen to a bunch of OAs, and it can be quite distancing. Um, and the other thing is like, it can feel like it's hard to cut down judge training in a way that's like easy to do with debate training. Like in debate training, um, the core skills in debate, which are just like generating arguments, or like responding to arguments, you can do with just the motion prompt, like motion prompt. Uh, give arguments for the motion, 
give, give arguments against the motion and let like, good work as like individual debate training, where it is like a little bit harder to like to do like individual judge training in this way. So at least kind of like within the traditional way in which people conduct training sessions. So I really suggest um, doing things like watching partial rounds together. Um, like now that, especially now that there's so much video content um, online, um, you don't even have to like combine your judge training with the speaker training. Like your speakers can go off and, 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 do, a and do a debate. Um, you know, one experienced speaker can judge them and help them. Um, and like people doing a judge training session, for example, they can watch um, a front half exchange online or just like PM LO for three on three and then go straight to like training the judging skills. So here I think uh, like kind of like the three core skills of judging. Everything else to me is 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 uh, nice to have. It's, it's, it's the icing on the cake. The, core, the three core skills are really simple. One is kind of like listening, identifying what speakers and teams said. The second skill is once you identify all the things that were said, you kind of match them to each other, right? Like it's like puzzle pieces. Uh, you like draw the arrow, whatever, whatever representation works for you, right? Like you, 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 you are. Uh, you need to have the awareness that like thing X that this team said, um, is really clashes with thing Y that this other team said, right? And then once you have that awareness, you kind of have skill to down pad. You, you, obviously, you can kind of um have different opinions on like did X beat Y or did Y beat X, but like the, the the second skill is just realizing that X and Y are, are about each other. Um, so that's the second skill, right? Like matching claims to responses or counterclaims. Um, or you can think of it using jargon, like fitting claims into clashes or, or whatever. It's kind of like organizing the things that the teams said. It's the second skill. And the third skill is weighing outcomes, which is now that you've organized all the claims and you have an answer to the question of did X beat Y, then maybe you might conclude, okay, so X beat Y, but then, you know, op said uh, argument C and then beat argument B on gov. So how do I weigh the fact that gov won some things and op won some things? Like how do I assess the size of that impact or whatever? Obviously I'm like skipping a lot of steps here. Like there's stuff about like, um, how, 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 how do I like, you know, analyze what stuff was explained versus what stuff was not explained and, and so on and so forth. But I kind of think that that's like, that's like harder stuff to teach, you know, which, which is just like, you, you will learn how to assess whether an explanation was proven the more you judge. And in terms of like a basic scaffold of judging, you just need to train these three skills. One, correctly identifying the things that teams have said. Two, sorting them out and matching one one claim to a different claim, and three, weighing the claims. So skill three requires a lot of time because skill three, like how do I decide which claim is better explained or how do I decide what is more important, kind of relies on developing good intuitions about the world. Um, it's kind of like saying to get better at debating, you just have to know more, which is like to an extent true. Um, and so we will not focus on how to develop skill three. I kind of think skill three just kind of develops over time as speakers, one, grow as human beings and get older from the age of like, as judges rather, grow older and from the age of like 18 to like 22 or, or whatever, and like learn more things about the world um, as they read more, as they judge and speak in more debates. So I think skill three kind of fixes itself over time. And also intuitions are just to an extent subjective. Like I, for example, could believe my kind of base intuition, for example, might be that like I, I believe left-wing ideas a little bit more or whatever, and other people could believe right-wing ideas a little bit more as a base intuition, and neither of these positions is, is necessarily wrong. So we won't talk about skill three, but we will talk about skill one and two. And to me, these are kind of like the claims that the, the, the things that you can train novice judges in quite easily. If you run like, um, you know, watch front half, watch PMLO, um, let's discuss um, what do we think uh, PM said? What do we think LO said? Okay, so um, which of these things was better than the other? Um, what what did, what in opening opposition responded to opening government? What in opening government responded to opening opposition? And this is a kind of like workshop style session that you can do concurrent to like a different room doing a debate, right? Like you don't, instead of like doing what I've seen some clubs do, or like my club even used to do this in the bad old days where it's like, 
the debaters will debate, then all the novice judges will judge the same debate. And then you go through like a long series of like listening to all the novice judges and all the senior judges give like a mini OA at the end of this debate. And by the end of it, everyone is tired and didn't really participate in a way, in an activity that would actually train their judging skills. You can get through all of that much quicker if you have debaters debate and practice debating in one room and then judges judge something else and practice judging or judging skills in one room. So to me, developing skill one and skill two are the kind of like the core things of judge development. Once you kind of do enough judge training sessions so that all the judges in your club are good at skill one and skill two, they will naturally pick up skill three along the way. And then once you do that, you can start to do what I call um, the kind of window dressing, like nice to have stuff. And, and that includes things like, how do I give feedback to teams? Or how do I make my OA sound nice? Or how do I convince teams my OA? And so on and so forth. Which again, other people have given workshops and lectures on. Um, and I kind of think that the kind of how to present my thinking stuff is secondary to having the correct thinking in the first place. So try this out as like the cornerstone of your club's judge training stuff. And I think maybe you won't have like immediate impacts in terms of like the, the novice judges in my club are going to suddenly break at tournaments. But as they kind of do this thinking, um, they will be in a position where I think they will more likely arrive at the correct call with the correct justifications. And once you're there, you can kind of bring in the stuff about like, how do you say things as a wing to convince your chair that you're correct? Or how do you give an OA that will convince the teams that you are correct? Because I think presenting this stuff accurately would satisfy both of those things. And so it's more important to kind of do the skill, to do and to practice the skills than to do spend more time doing and practicing how to present the skills. Like one is logically prior to the other. So I would focus on this stuff first. Um, really kind of like ironing out judging skills and training those judging skills. Um, and then kind of working on how to present those judging skills in in a com in a combat in a competitive context. Um, whereas I think a lot of judge training is just like keep judging, keep judging, keep judging. Uh, say the right buzzwords. Um, how do I sound nice as a wing? Um, how do I give my OA to convince a team? Like be comprehensive, whatever, whatever. And it's not focused on like kind of what I see as the core skills of judging. So um, this is what I would focus on for judge development. Um, so that's what I think the core of judge training should look at. But but really, you don't have to kind of follow this. It's just kind of already better than the status quo. If you, as a prospective UADC breaking speaker, as a pro prospective like UADC finalist or semi-finalist, go back and do judge training. Like any form of judge training is better than no judge training. Um, just giving every single member of your club some exposure to judging three on three or PP debates will help them get better at the activity and will also help develop a sort of trust in judges that can really undermine the activity. Because I think if you look at some circuits now, uh, it's worse in some places than others. People just go to rounds, go to tournaments, and they know that the judging is going to be bad. Like they know that they're going to get not just like one or two weird um, verdicts over the course of the tournament, but like maybe potentially like more than half of the verdicts or you know that they get will, will be kind of like questionable. And there's this like weird norm where like their seniors know it, you know it, everyone knows it. And it kind of just makes the whole activity demoralizing to do, right? Like if you go, if you know you go to a tournament and you're like, oh, well, I, I don't know I don't know whether I can trust the verdict of a judge. Like I, I will say all the correct PC things to be like, oh yeah, respect all judges, you know, like all, all takes are all calls are valid, like la la la, you know, don't and, and these things are all true. Like you, you shouldn't be mean to your judges. You you, you shouldn't like hound them for for hours on on, on online or in person as to like why they were right or wrong. You shouldn't like talk back, whatever. All these things are correct. But if there's kind of like a base level of distrust on judging quality, the whole circuit suffers. Um, and I think it's really important to start from the grassroots on to, to try to try to redress that. Like um, part of that is just, you know, the UADC breaking speakers judging rather than speaking at every tournament will just improve the judge quality. 
these speakers um, being willing to do judge training so that they become better judges rather than just kind of writing on speaking rap and conducting training for other people so that you know your novs do more judging and uh, get better at it over time like this is all stuff that will make the community stronger and when that happens that will mean that like over time people from that circuit will just do better at tournaments around the world okay so yeah I, it's it again this is my take on how you can do basic judge development skill one and skill two stuff um using like mini debates but you don't have to do this any judge training is better than no training um and it's really important to establish a norm that members of a debate club do some judge training um as a part of their skills development it's, it's a really important norm to establish okay so that is it for speaker and judge development like how do you help your club uh you know how can you help speakers la 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 okay so that's that for that section the last section is getting a first edge core gig and this is a thing that's going to happen to the people who we're discussing in this lecture you know you've broken at uadc now um you've broken at avp now you for for, 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 some, for some of you you might be the first um person in some time from your institution or your country to have done to have done so or to have to done so on a consistent basis and so you're going to get asked to edge core stuff um, and the natural reaction is, yay, rep, um, I've ascended the ladder, uh, you know, I, I, I have now kind of reached the ranks of like the lead and respect the debaters. And that's fine. Like everyone's a little bit vain like this. Uh, you know, we, we, we do debating cause we, we kind of like, like that. Um, and that's okay to be motivated by, by that. They're kind of like, just feel like, yeah, I've, I've, I've gotten there, whatever. Um, but then of course the next question is like, what do you do once you're there? Um, and one, I, I want to like, obviously it's kind of bad to just aim to ascend a ladder without kind of even thinking about what you're going to do once you're in a, once you're there. Um, and it kind of results in a lot of people just coasting like on edge calls, like, oh, I've gotten, I, I've gotten this edge call trip. I just now I've made it like, I don't really have to do anything now. It doesn't matter. Um, or two, to kind of view the edge call ship purely as a like position for vanity. Like I really want to set my emotions because, because they're mine. Um, and then people get really weirdly like competitive or uh, upset when that doesn't happen. Um, so again, I think like acknowledging that kind of like vanity aspect is fine and it is kind of what drives people to succeed. So that's okay, personal ambition. Um, but then I think it's, it's, it's good to kind of go through like what, what we can expect um, when you do a CA ship for the first time. Because anecdotally, it seems like one, um, lots of new CAs kind of, go onto our edge call and they just kind of like don't really know what they have to do, what they can do even, um, and wait for more experienced members of the edge call to set a tone, to kind of take the lead and to kind of get, get stuff going, um, which I think can lead to like a less fun experience for these new CAs if you kind of don't know what you can do um, or are just kind of like not aware of like the things that are expected of you. Um, that's one. Two, I think um, increasingly you, you'll see this like weird two track system of tournaments where like on, on one, you have these like, you know, really like big name tournaments and they will kind of attract all the old and experienced the CAs with like the glittering CVs accrued from years and years of being around and debating and like what have you. And the, the edge call will just be, you know, five of these people or whatever. And then you'll see some of the tournaments, which is just like, the edge call will just be like five people with very limited um, or scanty edge call experience. Like, like five people who are the people we're talking about in this lecture, just five people who have just, just broken at one or two majors and maybe like see it one thing. Um, and again, like that is kind of like the landscape of debate we have now. I ideally, I think you want a mix of experienced and less experienced edge call members so that you get some kind of like transmission of how to do things. But one, I'm not really sure how much teaching and learning goes on inside at edge call. Um, and two, it, it does feel like sometimes you just don't have that. You have five people who are like less sure of what to do. Um, and it's just kind of like thrown into it and asked to figure it out. So in this section, I kind of hope to um, cover a little bit of like what to expect when you start to edge call your first thing or second thing for the first time. So, okay. Um, what do edge calls do? So there's a checklist on the next page, but I think one thing to flag is that 
a lot of ad core work is just administrative. And so being good at the tools of administration is important. Um, not every member of Edge Core has to be conversant with Tabby Cat or Sheets or Docs or what have you, but it is useful if you are, and it is useful if more members of Edge Core know how to do these things. So um, I think the kind of first thing, it, like if you're kind of less, less fluent in using Docs or Sheets, is just kind of like play with these, uh, like learn to use like the sort function on Sheets. It's very basic stuff, you know. I, I'm not a Sheets or Excel, Excel wizard by, by any means, but just playing with these platforms and getting used to how to use them, like how to share stuff, uh, how to rank stuff without making the entire sheet fail, um, how to create a copy instead of like deleting your stuff, like just getting conversant with the software that everyone's going to use as a member of the Edge Core will make you less spooked when you start doing Edge Core work. And the same applies to Tappy Cam. Like, I feel like there are a lot of Edge Core members who have Edge Core for years and like do not know the ins and outs of Tabby Cat, uh, or like not even ins. I, I I don't I don't claim to know the ins and outs of Tabby Cat. I know some stuff. Um, and yeah, like that's very weird to me. Um, like again, you should know how to make preform panels on Tabby Cat. You should know how to change the feedback weights on Tabby Cat so that um you can like accurately view the judge scores, um, of your judges as the tournament goes on. These are just examples. Um, again. I think one thing when you get when when you start to take an edge core position, you get your first like tabby cat login exciting. Uh, it's just go in and play with the software, like learn how to use the tools of edge coring, and you'll find yourself less lost when um things are happening. And I think one of the kind of distancing things of being a new edge core member is like you're new. Maybe some other people are a little bit less new, and they seem like they know everything. And there's like this temptation to just be like oh, I'll just go with the flow, I guess. Um, and then kind of things just happen very quickly um, in a debate tournament. Like the, the motions get done, the, the rounds happen, la, la, la. And then you kind of come out of the edge core experience being like, oh, so what, what did I actually do? I don't know. Um, and I think that can be very distancing. So, and, and kind of an unpleasant experience for like a new edge core member to just kind of like feel like I don't really have that much of an input, you know, like these people just kind of like said things and then they're, like, their friends agree with them. And then I was just like, huh? Um, so again, I think knowing the tools of like what you're doing can one, make you useful and two, um, it can help you like know and feel like you know what's going on. So that's a, that's useful to have. Okay, the second thing is like basic checklist of what edge calls do. Again, this is like basic stuff, but uh, I feel like there have been enough tournaments I went to where like it seemed like people do not know this. Um, so just good to like get it out there, I guess. Um, so before the tournament, um, edge calls, typically the CAs, but often just kind of like the most responsible person on the edge core will do things like one, they will liaise with the outcome. Uh, they will settle the schedule. They will have a, they will find out the budget for how much they have to spend on IAs and so on and so forth with the outcome. Um, they will set up a tap team. They will talk to the tap team about acquiring registration info. This is really important. Lots of, somehow this gets forgotten a lot. And like, it's critical to the running of the tournament. If you don't do this before the tournament, you end up doing it on at round one, or you have a lot of missing information around one. Um, and you'll have to deal with it over the course of the tournament, which is never fun. So tap team, gathering all the necessary information, like novice status, language status, gender or region um, from speakers and judges. Um, and capturing and, and like inputting judge scores so that um, if you score all your judges the night before the tournament, um, then you can use the software to automatically give you an idea of how to allocate them. And then the software will kind of track their scores through the tournament. So you'll be able to um, allocate judges more easily rather than kind of having to go by memory or so on and so forth. Um, you want to set up an equity team which will handle clashes. So then people will give their clash to equity. Equity will give their will assess whether these clashes are fine. Um, they'll talk to teams and speakers and judges, and then they will pass this to tab and it will go into the tab. So again, you will prevent situations happening later on where um, at the last moment you discover that like this judge cannot judge this team, but 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 there is zero minutes of prep left and you have to like scramble to move people around. Um so this kind of prep work, uh I think it's like really easy to forget. It's like a really big part of what edge calls do. Um and note that like none of the stuff I discussed is that like, kind of like the glamorous stuff about what edge calls do is like like giving money to your friends so that 
to your qualified friends so that they can IA or setting motions and things like that. But it's like a huge part of what edge calls do. It's just like making sure the administration of the tournament works well in conjunction with Orcom, Tap Team, and Equity. So yeah, I think that's kind of like one big thing um, to kind of, I guess, demystify about what it is that edge calls do. Like this kind of prep work um, all needs to be done for the tournament. Usually the CA does it, but like I said, often sometimes the CA is just busy or lazy or whatever, and like it needs to be done. So um, that's kind of like part of the checklist. Okay, next part is like judge recruitment and tracking. So um, if you have an IA budget, like figure out how to uh, invite IAs or to call for IA, um, what's that? <laughs> Like do the open call for IAs thing, and then I can rank them, and um, you can like decide how much money you want to give each person. So, uh, going into a little bit more detail about like how this might look, um, you might do you might set up like a Google form, um, IA, um, name, institution, country, um, language status, all that kind of all that kind of like basic information about the IA, and then like CV, um make sure they don't submit too much because you'll have to read all of it. So I would say like five speaking achievements and five judging achievements is a normal standard. It is the standard that Madrid Worlds is using, by the way. So uh, don't read more than that. And ideally have a form that could cut off um, before people type more than that. And then it all goes in a sheet. You look at the sheet, people will score the judge. Um, typically the scoring might look something like 10 is like the best judge in the world and one is like the worst judge in the world or like a trainee um, and you would use like the judge um, speak the judge ranking scale of for chairs uh, that is on the world's manual um, and they could adapt that to three on three so like 10 one um, five is like you know uh, they could panel so typically you would want to get IAs who are like around a seven um, and that will be like a normal cutoff with which you would give money to IAs. But that's just a guide, right? So the idea is like, this is the stuff that um, Edge calls typically have to handle do their judge recruitment and also judge tracking. Like um, after you've decided who you're giving money to or who you are inviting to judge at your tournament as an IA, um, and also to kind of include uh, institutional or independent and minus one judges who you're not giving financial remuneration to, to track their availability, both for online and in person, uh, in case you have people who are like judging some rounds on the all rounds, you want like a separate sheet being like these guys are available this round and not their not this other round. So you have a good idea of like whether you have enough judges um, for each round of the tournament. So again, this unglamorous prep work, but like important. Um, and like this stuff will get more onerous and complicated the bigger the tournament. So it is like a hellish undertaking for worlds. It is like kind of a lot of work for like a UADC or AVP size tournament. And it might be not that much work at all for a small open or IV. Um, like the kind of like first few tournaments, you might be asked to edge call um, as someone with like one or two breaks um, at majors. So yeah, like you have to do that stuff. And finally, you, you, you have to do motions. Um, so I want to spend a little bit while I'm talking about motions because I feel like a lot of people think that edge calls main duty is to make motions. And like, that's true to some extent. Um, but it's also kind of not, like, I cannot stress more that given the stuff that we just talked about on the Edge Core checklist, like Edge Core members are far more than just motion idea generators. Um, some people are really good at coming up with motion ideas. Some people are less good at that. Some people, uh, even just on topic of motions, might be better kind of like tweaking the wording of motions to make them work or like critiquing existing motion ideas and showing why certain aspects of them do not work well and how they can be improved to become better. Um, and like all of that is contributive to an edge call. So again, I think that's a common misconception. Like edge call is about like, I go on there and I set motions and if I can't set motions, I am bad. Or if my motions get like downvoted in the motion ranking process, then um, I should feel upset and so on and so forth. But like that's that's kind of like not not the entirety of it. Okay, so the motion setting process, what does that look like? Um, typically these days, what people do is they have a sheet um, and before the tournament, they will ask people to put in motions on the sheet, like people suggest motions. These will all go in a list. And then also before the tournament, you'll ask people to rank the motions. 
typically from one to five. So one being, I do not want to set this motion at all. I definitely don't. And five being, I definitely do want to set this motion. Um, and then they will sort the motions in order of the average ranks. Um, and then they will discuss the motions. So this discussion could happen um, like live in person for in-person tournament on Zoom for the sorts of like Zoom or hybrid tournaments that we still are seeing in Asia. Um, or it could happen on the sheet itself. Um, so people kind of asynchronously writing comments about like this motion and having the person who submitted the motion kind of answer some of their doubts and so on and so forth. Um, and I think it's just kind of really important to remember, like you, you actually want to discuss the motion. Um, I think a lot of uh, a, like common step in edge calls to like neglect that kind of discussion, just be like, this motion seems fine, this motion seems fine. Oh, it's like cool, I guess. Blah, blah. And um, I really want to encourage even newbie edge call members or like especially newbie edge call members, I would say, to not do that, to, um, to kind of like have some pride in setting like a good motion that has been thought through or to think through the other suggestions that fellow members of the edge calls, even more experienced people, have been said, uh, have said. So I think sometimes maybe a more experienced person will be like, well, I've seen this done before. Um, you know, it was fine. And then as a new edge core member, you might feel like, uh, well, they said that and they have edge core a few tournaments. So maybe I should just go with the flow and not kind of ask them further about it. And I think that is kind of missing out a chance to one, critique the motion. Maybe you have seen something that this more experienced person has not. And two, you're missing an opportunity to learn, like to have them kind of, give the reasons for why the motion is fine, which will then inform you in future about what certain motions, about why certain motions are fine and certain motions are less fine. So um, I there is all of this kind of like reluctance, I think, to potentially to kind of do things as a as a kind of like person in this kind of middle bracket, you know, like the newly senior debater. Um, and I think my kind of advice is like, don't be afraid to try stuff and don't be afraid to kind of like, you know, be shot down. Um, because like no one is really kind of assessing you uh, at this point, like you have a lot of room to grow. So yeah, like go through that kind of, do the work to kind of, you know, critique motions if you think something is bad um, or to suggest improvements to a motion if you think something is promising, but like could be fixed. Um, I think there's a tendency for people to just kind of look at, to kind of like vote up or vote down a motion based on like its initial suggested form. Whereas I think of edge coring or like motion setting more as like a workshopping effort where you kind of like, you have certain ideas and you try to make some of them work and you know, either that happens um, or, or it doesn't. And it's kind of like very collaborative. So don't feel bad if like, you know, you don't get your motions passed. It might not be your strength. Um, and you'll kind of like learn from the process um, or figure out like what some people like and what some people don't. You also find it like, um, motion ranking can be very subjective, like because different edge calls have just different edge call level people, like whatever, just have such different subjective preferences for what works as a motion and what doesn't. So you'll find that like um, a certain motion you suggest at this tournament, everyone will love um, or hate. And then you suggest it again at a different tournament, everyone will love it instead of hating it the first time. So don't be discouraged if like stuff like that happens. Um, yeah, like you're not just a motion idea generator. Don't get upset if your motions get shot down. Um, try to participate actively and like actually making motions good. Um, think like a debater when thinking about the motion. I think a lot of edge calls when setting motions start to enter like an edge call mindset where it just, yeah, like, like the motion sounds like it should work, so it should work. But, you know, if you kind of like use your debating brain again, you realize that like debaters will find all sorts of weird ways to make the motion not work or, make the motion be really biased in their favor. And that's, that's what you would do if you were debating. And so it's important to kind of put motions through that test um, or that discussion before you kind of push them into the wild and, and let people play with them. Um, so yeah, like on motions, I, I do think people can, can, can ought to feel more free and less afraid to be more critical during the edge call process, during the edge call meetings. Like prep work aside, um, all the kind of administrative grunt work aside, the motions are like maybe like the fun part of edge coring. If you like that kind of stuff, motion discussions can be fun. Um, it's certainly the stuff that you'll spend a lot of your meeting time on. And so you should kind of spend it, uh, you know, actually doing active critique rather than just kind of like going through administrative stuff. Okay, so um, 
that is motions. Yeah. Finally, um, yeah. So I guess finally, this kind of like bleeds into the subtle motions. Like, don't be afraid to speak up. This is about stuff that this is about like, you know, you you're done with the prep work. You're done with the motions. You know, at the tournament itself. Um, remember that a lot of edge core work is about. It's not just about like letting things flow. It's kind of intervening where you see something is not right. So if you see, for example, someone like allocating judges in a way that just kind of like rewards their friends, or um, if you see like a particular judge allocation isn't very diverse with regards to gender or region or language status or what have you um, in like an outround panel, like it's, especially as a kind of like junior edge core member, like a less experienced edge core member, like you know that a tournament is gonna to go run just fine if you shut up and say nothing. But I think people should act the sense of fairness to not shut up and say nothing and to kind of point out the instances where they see something as an issue. And maybe your, your fellow Edge Core members will agree and be glad that you spotted something that needed to be fixed. Or maybe they won't agree. Uh, and that could be for good reasons or bad reasons. But again, you are denying yourself the experience of learning through all that or even having kind of tried to do the right thing if you choose to not. Do these things again it's very easy as an edge core member i think to kind of not do things to just kind of like oh okay tournament runs smoothly everyone happy everyone go home la 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 that's okay and yeah that is the bare minimum that edge core members should aim to do like make sure the tournament runs smoothly but also to act in the sense of fairness um i think it's really important the the other thing here to note is i think like often when like issues happen at tournaments um like often examples are like for example tap teams will Make mistakes or even edge calls will make mistakes with regards to like um like the draw sometimes sometimes like teams are not drawn to face the correct opponent or like some scores are like not deducted when they should be and the break um is wrong or like whatever and you don't catch it immediately um like i think you shouldn't be afraid to be upfront about these things and just be like yeah we, we fucked up we're, we're sorry that we didn't spot this mistake and like teams were affected. Um, I think, again, there's kind of like a fear that you'll like face the online or like the real life backlash because uh, you like your mistakes, uh, even if they were like not malicious, like cost someone, some team, some judge the break or, or whatever. But it's just really important to kind of be honest and transparent about this kind of stuff and, and, and all up to making mistakes because that will happen. Um, and I think like edge calls that have tried to cover this stuff up have, have kind of like never gone well. Um, whereas edge calls that are kind of honest about it and just apologize, um, find that like they face far less backlash than they would perhaps expect because people are kind of reasonably understanding. Like everyone is human. Everyone is uh, doing this stuff. It's like mostly students at the end of the day. Everyone's busy, mistakes happen. So yeah, act the sense of fairness and, and don't be don't be afraid to like what oh, mistakes because they, they will happen. Um the last thing is just like some small thing, which is it's 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 good to have someone sit out each round to deal with contingencies as they um appear. Like if you can on the edge call, having one person just kind of watch the round, deal with things like last minute clashes or whatever is good to have. Um, but yeah, so hopefully that was like a reasonable overview of what the edge coring experience is like for new people who have not edge caught yet and will soon be called to do that thing. Um, hopefully that was a good overview of like the ways in which, um, you know, someone like you who has just broken at UADC, um, how you can take responsibility as a member of the community, um, how you can contribute to a speaker and judge development in your community and the sorts of things you can expect um, as you're called on to do edge call work. Um, hopefully that was helpful. And that's one hour. Um, yeah. Good night and good luck for you, DC, everyone.